Welcome, everybody. Thanks for tuning in to our webinar today on uh, how to make better hash. So I'm really excited to be here talking with our uh, Director of Innovation, Dave Airy. Uh, we'll get into some introductions and, uh, and talk about the presentation there. So without further ado, welcome. Uh, as some of you may know, I'm Andrew Cotter. I have uh, done a few of our webinars here at Whistler Technologies. I've been uh, with the company for about a year now. Prior to that, I was working in the legal industry for uh, for a number of years, working in a variety of positions from engineering to head of solventless roles. Um, I have uh, been making hash at scale for, for a couple of years through that. And I always looked at Whistler Techno Technologies as being the the leader in the space. I wanted to learn more about equipment design and, and everything that, that that team was doing to, you know, make better hash and make more of it. So I'm really excited to be here. It's It's been a hell of a year so far and I'm looking forward to many more. And um, I will pass it on to, to Dave Airy who will, uh, who will introduce himself. Yeah, thanks Andrew and welcome everybody to this webinar. Um, as Andrew mentioned, my name is David Airy. Uh, I'm the Director of Innovation. Uh, I, have the, I have a background in mechanical engineering and finance uh, and I've been with Whistler Technology since 2018, just after company inception. Um, my main responsibilities is uh, process development, mechanical design, continuous improvement of our machines, etc. Um, and I'll, I have to say it's been an absolute pleasure and an honor to work alongside some of the the, the biggest and brightest minds in the solventless space. Um, you know, every day is a school day, absorbing knowledge, trying to convert that knowledge into into commercialized solutions that can bring better quality products, better quality solventless products to the end consumer. Um, I'm joining today from Gold Coast in Queensland, Australia, and I'd like to give a special shout out to anybody else uh, on my side of the pond. Um, yeah, I'm really excited for this webinar, and uh, you know, without further ado, I think we should get stuck into it. So over to you, Andrew. Yeah, let's go. Sweet. So just a quick little itinerary for everybody so you guys uh, know what we'll be talking about today. Um, of course, we've just gone through our introductions. We're going to start talking about biomass, talk about environment, move into washing, uh, the cold chain, automation and repeatability. We'll finish off with talking about ending the day, cleaning up the lab and stuff. Uh, we do have a super special WT micro reveal. Um, which is something I think everybody's going to be super excited about. And then we'll cap things off with a little Q&A. Um, like I said before, for, for those who didn't hear, um, if you do have questions during the presentation, please feel free uh, to throw those in the chat. If they're applicable to what we're talking about in the moment, we can do our best to answer those. Otherwise, we will wait till the end and, and address those questions then. Sweet. So biomass. Um, of course, with solventless, uh, biomass, the material you're working with, your input material is going to be one of the most important factors. Uh, as they say, fire in, fire out. In my opinion, this starts with genetics. There have been a couple of breeders who over the last few years have really been developing strains that are specifically uh, you know, centered towards solventless extraction. Of course, we have three different types of trichomes. And when we're making hash, we're really going after the trichomes with the biggest heads and a small stock. And so when we have a genetic that has mostly this type of trichome, we can have really efficient extractions that aren't going to take as long, as well as having terpene profiles that are going to lend themselves to working well in ice water extraction. Um, oftentimes, you know, it's, it's not a rule, but oftentimes things like lemony strains or, or other profiles uh, with more water soluble terpenes uh, don't end up washing as well. They're greasing out on the bag. They're hard to collect. They're hard to work with. So finding the right genetics um, that will a work in your cultivation operations or in your your partner's cultivation operations, and then for you as a hash maker will will work really well and be be really easy to work with. Produce some really nice resin, and um, have a have a really high quality hash output overall. And um, when I start working with hash or when I'm working with the flowers and I'm, and I'm getting my process ready, pre-rinsing can be a really good thing to do when you're working with outdoor biomass. And so when I say pre-rinsing, this is going to be a step that we're going to do after the freezer um, and before, before we get it right into the wash. Pre-rinsing can look like a number of different things. For me, if I'm noticing that the biomass is a little bit dirtier, maybe it's got some dirt and stuff, 
um, and so on. This is probably not as much to worry about for, for indoor operations that are a little more sanitary, but outdoors on the farm where there's dust getting kicked up, that's coming onto the trichomes and stuff. We, we ideally want to eliminate that out of the product. So what we can do is what, how I would do it is um, load the material in the tank, get everything filled with cold water, and then just do a simple flush. Flush that through the system. If you're hand washing, just, just doing a dump, running all of that water through your bags to verify that um, no hash is getting missed out on there. And then you can see for yourself, is, is this mostly hash? Is there not too much? You know, on your, on your first batch, if you have multiple loads to work with, this can be a great way to identify, is this something I'm gonna need to repeat in my process? Or if you're looking in your bags, there's pretty much nothing in there, then that's fantastic. You're working with some uh, very clean material and you can say, okay, I've checked, my material's pretty clean and we'll just move on to, to continuing a, our normal operations. Of course, after we've done our pre-rinse, a pre-soak is also really essential just to rehydrate and thaw the material. And I'll let Dave talk a little bit about that. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. And I think, uh, you know, it's important to note that uh, the job of the hash maker is obviously to just make sure that none of that um, amazing quality that was created by the cultivator is lost uh, during that process. So I think it's really important to take your time, uh, respect the plant, you know, it takes six plus months to create this biomass and you're going to wash that in a single day. So if, you, if it takes an extra 15, 20 minutes here and there, just to be extra careful throughout that process and, and maintain that quality, um, very much worthwhile. So, so always respecting the plan just throughout a, a, every step of the way, I think is going to be really important. Um, when we get into pre-soak, there's obviously two categories here. We've got fresh, frozen and dry. Uh, I'm going to start with fresh, frozen. Uh, and in general, I mean, there's mixed beliefs here, but, but I still like to recommend a pre-soak for fresh, frozen as well. Uh, it's not as long, in my opinion, as dry material. Uh, and all, all we're trying to really do is, is uh, we don't need to rehydrate because it's been harvested fresh and, and frozen in that state. It's already hydrated. Um, but depending on the storage temperature of that biomass, you know, a lot of industrial freezers operate anywhere between negative 20 to negative 40 degrees Celsius. And that's going to quite, create quite a brittle uh, structure to the plant material on the inside of that flower. So the job of the pre-soak when you're dealing with fresh frozen is really to bring the temperature of that biomass to the same temperature as your process. And that's going to just make everything a lot more malleable so that when you start mixing, you're not going to break apart small fragments of leaf and, and other plant material that's then going to find its way down into your collection bags, creating green or discolored hash, which no one, nobody uh, you know, wants. So uh, for, for, for fresh frozen, you know, it can be anywhere from sort of five to 15 minutes, I would say. And I'm going to talk about how to develop the, the exact pre-soak time that's, that's suitable for your particular batch of biomass that you're processing on the day. Um, but firstly, I'll just talk quickly about dry biomass. Um, in general, we're pre-soaking dry biomass for a lot longer, um, 20 plus minutes, sometimes upwards of 45 minutes. And, and it's really going to be dependent on how dry that biomass is, how dense those nugs are, how big those nugs are. Um, and it, it's, a, it's a similar sort of uh, theory, but a different process. We're rehydrating rather than thawing. And we're just trying to get all that, all that plant matter to a state where it is malleable, where it can be mixed efficiently without fragmenting and breaking into small pieces that's going to then create contaminants in the final product. So how do we determine the pre-soak time? I, I hate the idea of just saying, here's a hard and fast rule, fresh frozen is, is X number of minutes and Y is Y number of minutes. I think an iterative approach where you're actually verifying that pre-soak time is always going to be the best way, especially when dealing with a new batch of biomass. So what I like to recommend is that we, we soak for, let's take a guess, let's say we're, we're doing dry, let's start with 20 minutes. Let's set it, let's actually set a timer so we, we're consistent every time. When that timer goes off, I want to I want to find one of the biggest, most dense looking nugs in that batch that's in, in submerged in water, take it out, break it apart, and actually physically verify, like visually verify that it has soaked all the way through to the middle. If it still seems dry, if it's still powderizing when you break it apart, that means that you probably need to pre-soak for longer. So in that case, I would set another timer, wait again, verify again, and then just keep going in a trial and error sort of a process until you're really confident that all of the nugs in that batch have been soaked and hydrated all the way through. Uh, I don't think you can over-soak material. We've had, we've had material soaking overnight and still been been able to do a really solid extraction from that. So as long as, that, as everything stays cold, I would err on the side of caution and soak for longer uh, rather than shorter. 
Yeah, absolutely. I will also mention, uh, for those curious, we do have another webinar really focused on harvesting and freezing your biomass and getting it ready for the process. So we're not going to be touching on that as much today, but still very, very important for, for getting your process started. And and like I said, to, to make better hash, you have to have really good starting material. So if you're curious about that, feel free uh, to go check that out uh, whenever whenever you can. Sweet. So environment. Environment is hugely important when we're looking to make high quality hash products. Of course, when we're doing these solventless procedures, we're typically not working um, with the really tight filters that we might be working with when doing solvent extraction. We don't have five micron filters. We're not dissolving stuff. We're, we're, we don't have a step where we can really eliminate any sort of physical contaminant and just push um liquids through or anything like that so we really need to make sure we have a we have an ultimately very clean environment also as you can notice with the equipment typically everything is very open there's a lot of opportunity for for potential contaminants to happen so we're going to talk about how to reduce those and i think that starts with having a clean and organized lab um firstly with ppe when i was running my labs i always wanted to ensure that i had the correct amount of ppi PPE in the appropriate sizes for, for all of the team members that would be working in there. When working in the ice water extraction lab or even in a, in a rosin area, I'm a really big fan of wearing a rain jacket kind of style coats, waterproof pants, uh, sort of plasticky style materials that aren't going to have many fibers that are going to risk um, falling off and, and coming into your product. You know, if you're collecting your hash on you and getting ready for freeze drying, if you have little fibers coming off of your clothing, that will end up in your hash. And if you're pressing rosin, same thing. And having uh, sanitary tools and good organization for that. Having convenient places to either hang tools. Uh, I'm a really big fan of these magnetic knife blocks that you can use. Um, a lot of the steel tools will uh, will stick to those. And that gives you an opportunity to, to ensure that the contact points of your tools are never touching dirty surfaces. Alternatively, having like a uh, stainless steel table on wheels, you keep that as your, your sanitary area, you're cleaning that throughout your day, and then that can be a place for your, for your clean tools to stick around. Um, another good option uh, while you're making hash and stuff is if you can have a container uh, with ice and water in it, keep your spoons in that, that'll keep them cold, and will also act like a little rinse vessel in between your collections and ensuring um, you're getting any trichomes that have stuck to that spoon off of that and th those will not cross contaminate when you go for for further collections and finally when it comes to spoons i like to have a spoon that's dedicated uh to collecting the money bag as we call it usually like a 73 or a 90 i really like to use one spoon to collect those microns and then i'll have a you know secondary or tertiary spoon uh for collecting out of the other bags this is another great system I like to use to just sort of avoid that cross-contamination. Um, next would be your workflow layout. Eliminating potential cross-contamination situations where people are passing in between uh, an ice water extraction area, maybe going to a rosin area or sifting or so on, really trying to create a nice flow that's circular um, and that people can stay sort of around their stations um, or in their area of the room. Little things like people don't often think about, but when we're sifting hash, there is obviously going to be some hash becoming airborne. It's quite light. Um, any hash that might be then stuck to your clothing, if you're going into a rosin area, that can then stick to products and things. Um, and I've already talked about tool storage, but once again, just having good areas to store your things. And the easier you make your life, the easier it'll be um, to keep things clean and, and make this a habit. So I just think uh, these are little things that you can think about to, to avoid the, those possible contaminations in your product. Um, and I'll let Dave start talking about uh, air filtration and clean equipment. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. And before I do, I'll just say, um, you know, creating some accountability around the cleaning of the lab, especially those operating in commercial environments. You know, it's one thing that the lab gets clean perfectly while the boss is around. It's another thing, you know, uh, weeks and weeks go by and, and different operators come in and out of the room. Um, unless you create accountability, you know, checklists on the wall, make people uh, put signatures on different cleaning aspects of each day, making sure that things are clean the same way every time, I think is really important. And it's little things like that that are just going to over time just make sure that the quality of the product coming out of that lab is going to remain consistent for the long run. 
Um, so if we're talking about air filtration, I mean, generally speaking, anything that you can do to minimize airborne particulates, not only in your, in your extraction room, but also your freeze drying, rosin pressing, uh, packaging rooms, et cetera, any airborne particulates are gonna be, uh, you know, not good for business. Um, you know, even for those washing at home or in small labs, this can be as simple as just removing items from the room that are likely to create these particles. You know, for example, really dry paper towel, when you rip it in half, you see little little bits of fiber float into the air that can then find their way into your hash. Um, you know, dirty or dusty floors or equipment. So again, it's really important to, to keep things clean and make sure you're minimizing areas where contaminants might come from. Um, for those of us operating in more commercial environments and, and particularly those who, who are supplying products to med uh, medical markets uh, under pharmaceutical regulations, we, we do like to recommend um, adding positive pressure and particulate filtration um, into the extraction, collection, freeze drying, rosin and packaging rooms. Um, it'll dramatically reduce the risk of any airborne contaminants finding their way into your final product. Um, and this really does lead nicely as well into the next point here, which is having clean equipment. Uh, so the first point here is to do with surface finishes. So this is really to do with equipment selection. Um, it, you know, it's really important to closely consider uh, the materials and surface finishes of any surfaces that are going to be in direct contact with the product. Um, the smoother or more polished that surface, the easier it's going to be to clean. Um, you know, for those of you at home or in un unregulated markets, we're going to recommend at bare minimum having food grade plastics and avoiding matte finished surfaces with, that are in contact with the product. Um, where possible, obviously. Um, also ensuring that you have access to proper cleaning chemicals and verifying that those chemicals are compatible with the, with the materials that you've selected for your equipment is going to be really important. The last thing you want to do is use a really aggressive detergent or, or acidic wash and find out later that that's actually eroding the, that food grade plastic and then leaching harmful chemicals into that final product. So it is important to verify that as well. Um, for, for those of you who are in a more commercial setting, uh, we obviously always recommend stainless steel. Um, it's, it's really important though to note that not all stainless steel was created equally. Um, it is a really common misconception that stainless steel doesn't rust and unfortunately that isn't the case. Um, and so there are two main types of stainless steel specifications that are commonly used and that's 304 and 316. Um, it is really important to note that 304 is not nearly as corrosion resistant as, as 316. Um, and this is due to the addition of molybdenum uh, in 316 that drastically reduces the likelihood of rust formation. Um, even with that, 316 can still rust if exposed to the wrong conditions. So it's really important to familiarize yourself with the conditions that encourage rust formation, such as harsh chemicals, surface scratches, abrasions, uh, lower surface finish specifications, uh, and consistently leaving your equipment damp are all, all things that are gonna help encourage rust formation. Um, and specifically so if you're running with 316, uh, sorry, 304. Um, uh, it's also, you know, important to be aware that, um, uh, you know, the, the more time and, and care that you spend cleaning that equipment um, and, and just maintaining it, keeping it dry, uh, the, the lower your chances of rust formation uh, on those services. And so where possible, obviously choose equipment made from 316. Um, at, at Whistler Tech, we always specify a really good surface finish. It's either it's an it's a 32 RA or a number four dairy finish and 316 on all wetted surfaces. So that's going to dramatically improve not only the cleanability, but also the longevity of your equipment as well. So it just means that you're going to spend more time uh, making hash and less time dealing with surface rust and potentially decommissioning uh, old equipment that's that's um, you know showing signs of age. Uh, next on the list here is washdown rated electrical. Uh, obviously, making water hash involves a lot of water and spills on the floor. Uh, we always recommend that, that all electrical equipment, that's motors, um, pumps, uh, electrical cabinets, um, buttons, switches, touch screens, um, receptacles and plugs should all be, should all be washdown rated. Uh, this not only protects the operator from the chances of short circuits and electrocution, but it also means that you're then able to freely wash down that equipment and get rid of any surface dust or debris that might have collected on those surfaces. So uh, if that's not possible for you, if you're operating at home or if your equipment isn't, isn't wash down rated, uh, it's a good idea to try and elevate any electrical up off the floor so that you can still get really good access with your hose to wash down any of those uh, surfaces just to keep everything extra clean. Um, next on the list, we've got drainability, and this ties in nicely, I think, with the, with the discussion about rust formation. Uh, leaving stainless steel wet consistently is going to start to create rust, 
and that's going to limit the life of your equipment and also potentially you're going to have rust particles finding their way into your final product um, so ideally storing your equipment dry um, it's not only going to reduce the likelihood of corrosion but also drastically reduces the chances of microbiological contamination um, and so if possible choose equipment that's designed for 100 percent drainability um, you know, that just means that at the end of the day, you can open all valves and, and things like that and everything, all the, all the stagnant water is going to naturally drain. Um, and if that's not possible, then add into your cleaning procedure ways of removing excess water from that equipment at the end of each day. Um, you know, maybe you've got buckets that don't drain all the way, so let's store them upside down. Let's make sure that any water that's in them is going to drain out overnight. And when you come in the next day, everything is going to be nice and dry. You're going to limit the chance of microbiologicals, limit the chances of rust and therefore have better quality products in the long run. Um, pay particular attention to pumps and flexible hoses. Um, where possible, all pumps should include a housing drain. Um, so what happens if you don't have a housing drain is, is at the end of the day, that pump housing is always going to have a little bit of water remaining that's sitting stagnant. Um, the last thing we want to do is go away for a weekend uh, with a pump that housing that's, that's sit there with, uh, with processed water you know, left in it over the weekend. Um, growing all sorts of nasty uh, microbiologicals uh, that are then going to introduce themselves into your process. Uh, at Whistler Tech, we always include a housing drain on our pumps. If you don't have access to that, then it's probably worth considering either disassembly or inverting those pumps and flexible hoses at the end of each day. Basically, just like looking through your entire piping network and looking for low spots, anywhere that's going to collect water uh, that's not going to drain on its own, you should have a, a, a way of, of removing the water from those locations. Um, just as, as uh, you know, something to put on the checklist on the wall um, that should be followed at the, every, uh, at the end of each day. Uh, and then finally, component selection. Um, so if possible, obviously always choose a bare minimum food, if not pharmaceutical grade components. Um, it's also important to ensure that any gearboxes or bearings that are anywhere near your process have been lubricated with food grade grease. Um, the last thing you want to have is a non-food grade grease leaking out of one of the seals, finding its way into your process lots of nasty chemicals in those types of greases. So it's important to double check that. Um, and, and finally, it's just really important to assess the cleanability of all of the wetted components. Um, you know, and be wary of, of any exposed threads or bolts that are near your process that there are areas where contaminants can collect and microbiologicals can grow. Um, you know, ball valves in, in, in particular are generally not considered sanitary. I do see a lot of ball valves in the industry and I think it's important to note that there's only a couple of ball valve designs out there that can actually be cleaned in a CIP cycle. Um, for ball valves that are, are more of an industrial sort of specification, even if they've got tri clamps, it doesn't mean that they're going to clean themselves nicely just by pumping some bleach solution or cleaning solution through them. So just be aware about that. And, and you know, maybe every week or every other week, take those valves apart, inspect the valve seat, give everything a good soaking ISO, and just make sure you're keeping on top of cleaning on, of those aspects. Uh, all right, Andrew, you want to get me to the next slide, please? Yeah, let's go. Sweet. My favorite part. Um, washing. So, of course, washing, uh, I would say your process should really depend on your product goals. Um, before you start, you know, just going ahead and making hash, you should think to yourself, what am I trying to make and who am I trying to make it for? Um, you can make a really good quality entry level product. Um, that's going to sell at a value price. You can make a really good quality product for the connoisseurs and you can make a really good quality product that's just going to go to edibles. And when I say good quality, like Dave mentioned, avoiding potential contaminations like grease um, or other factors, making sure you're working with the right equipment and so on. And so I think today we're, we're really focused on, on talking about how we can make hash for the connoisseurs and then obviously there will be some trickle down that applies also to these to these other products but um getting into agitation and things when i'm starting a process i really like to to start as gentle as possible until we get to a point um where we say the mixture is fluidized and um, when the mixture is fluidized that's when you notice that everything is sort of really starting to mix cohesively uh, if you're hand paddling you'll notice that they feel a lot less chunky and you can get a really good flow. Um, so if I'm hand paddling, what that light agitation looks like is just a couple paddle strokes, pushing material down, just trying to get it moving around a little bit, not really getting into any figure eight patterns at that stage or too much back and forth, just little 
little strokes of the paddle through the water just to to get things moving and and those gentle agitations do actually end up removing a fair bit of trichomes and you'd be really surprised to see what can come off with just a really gentle agitation if i'm using a machine you know i might be operating around 30 to 40 percent of my operating capability of the strength of the motor um on our on our equipment everything is set to percentages so that's how i like to look at it and so as long as everything's mixing just just really lightly everything's just kind of starting to move around and stuff that's really nice and then slowly i will start to ramp things up and um, i do typically like to get to my what i'll say uh max rpm sort of around uh maybe 10 15 minutes into the process so if we're doing a run and dump style that might mean um, getting towards you know the second wash or the third wash is where I'm really going to start ramping things up. Uh, our systems uh, work with continuous flow, so it's a closed loop. We're constantly cycling our process water uh, through a vibratory uh, through a vibratory sieve. Um, the hash is getting uh, sent to our bubble bags for sieving, and the rest of the water is returning to the agitation tank. So, either system, whichever you're using. I do typically like to sort of ramp up as I'm getting later into the process. And uh, typically hash that I have um, extracted at these higher RPM levels, I might be looking to, to do a visual inspection on or at least separate from, from my first qualities that were extracted with a really light agitation um, from what was extracted with a higher, um, higher force agitation. Not to say that that hash extracted with the higher force is necessarily going to be worse. Um, I just like to keep them separate until I've been able to confirm uh, that some of that hash extracted with the higher force uh, can still be added to my A-grade products. Um, I will let Dave get into uh, uh, the equipment overloading and agitation patterns, because I know, uh, especially when it comes to agitation patterns, we've done a ton of work um, to design what we feel is the best agitation pattern for uh, for this extraction. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. And um, so I think it's uh, to to begin with, it's it's important to note that you should always take the stated throughput capacities uh, of of various equipment available uh, with a grain of salt. Um, you know, we do see a lot of pretty bold claims floating around the industry, uh, and more often than not, when we try and verify these claims, we we can't. Um, so it is important to just you know adjust your expectations there. Um, the, there's a couple of scenarios that specifically you should avoid overloading. Uh, the first of which is if you're if you're doing a run and dump sort of style operation. So that's if you're agitating for a predetermined amount of time, you're dumping all that water into your collection bags, you're returning the water and agitating again. That's what we consider a run and dump. And so what happens when we overload that that tank if we're in that run and dump style is we're not leaving enough space between the buds for trichomes to find their way to the bottom and successfully exit the machine. So what we see is when you do that dump. There's so much bio, if, you, if you're overloading in this situation, there's too much biomass in that space. And while a lot of the trichomes may have been broken off the buds, they're getting caught up in that biomass when you're doing that dump. And even with several rinse cycles, it can be really difficult to free those trichomes and, and actually get them to exit. Um, the second situation is uh, for, for agitators that rely on a vortex or basically indirectly mixing your product. Um, so I'm talking about bottom mixers or, or disc sort of style agitators. Um, these agitators aren't directly, it's not like a hand paddle where you're directly impacting or, or moving the product around. They're actually creating a vortex and then that vortex is what's trying to encapsulate all that material and fluidize the mix. Um, so what we see, especially with those sort of style agitators, is when you get above a certain uh, material loading, uh, you're not going to get the, the, the right amount of mixing. And so to get it to mix, what operators will often do is just keep ramping up that RPM quicker and quicker and quicker. You won't see anything happening on the surface. That material is just sitting there like a block, but underneath that impeller is spinning faster and faster and faster, trying to make enough of a vortex to overcome all of that material floating on top to eventually fluidize. And when that does eventually fluidize, now we've got a really high velocity happening right next to the impeller. And that's when you run the risk of shredding material and creating green contaminants. So for anyone running that sort of style, I mean, they're great for smaller batch operations and, and people with, with low throughput capacities. Um, but you just have to be aware that leaving enough space in the tank so that all the buds have have room to move, the trichomes can drop to the bottom, uh, it is really important to consider. Um, so moving through to, to agitation patterns and extraction efficiency. Um, first and foremost, your extraction efficiency is just uh, defined by the percentage 
of the available cannabinoids that you're able to remove from the biomass with your process. So as a really basic example, if we test our biomass and we calculate we've got a kilogram of THC going into the tank, if we're able to extract 800 grams of THC in our dry hash, that means we've got an 80% extraction efficiency, just as a basic example. And so the factors that are gonna impact um, your extraction efficiency, first and foremost, is gonna be your agitator efficiency. Um, how efficient is your agitator able to consistently apply fluid forces across those trichome heads? Um, secondly, is gonna be agitation time. Uh, with, with cold water extraction, it's always the law of diminishing returns. You're gonna get a lot of yield in the first time period, a little bit less yield in the next and so on and so forth. So the longer that you're able to agitate, um, in general, the more yield you're gonna get up to a certain limit, and in general, with cold water extraction, we can never exceed about 85%. Um, and that's, of course, biomass dependent. Um, the next on the list is about the amount of power that we're able to apply to our mixture. Uh, so I mentioned about bottom mixers really spinning a, a lot, but not being directly connected to the mixture. They're trying to create a, a, a vortex and get everything to mix. Um, so that's an inefficient transfer of power, in my opinion. Um, so the, the amount of power that we can apply has got to do with the RPM, the horsepower, and also the fluid dynamic optimization of that agitator, how we've designed our impellers, are there baffles involved? Uh, all these factors are going to have an impact on how much force we're able to translate from our motor to the actual mixture and therefore to fluid forces across those trichome heads. So that's going to speed up your extraction um, if, if that is, has been optimized. Um, and lastly, it's about uh, your ability, as I mentioned earlier, to successfully separate the trichomes from the biomass. Those doing a run and dump style, it, it, it means nothing to break the trichome away from the biomass if you're not able to then separate those trichomes from the biomass in the tank. Um, so avoiding overloading for run and dump sort of style. Uh, at Whistler Technologies, we employ continuous flow, and that's how we're able to load so much more biomass into our extractors for a given volume compared to the majority of the competition. Um, and, and, and that's really how we're able to achieve a better efficiency as well by consistently just sucking those trichomes out of the tank as soon as they're broken off. We're basically rinsing or, or washing that material throughout the entire cycle, which is how we're able to successfully separate those trichomes from the biomass throughout that process. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. Um, let's move on. Cold chain. So of course, with um we're sort of transitioning to to a new term new term we're calling it cold water extraction versus ice water extraction as we start to move um into an iceless methodology of processing um but however you want to call it what is ultimately important is that we're keeping things cold um this can start with uh filling your tanks and getting the the ultimate efficiency out of that we really recommend water chillers uh, at Whistler Technologies, we have a great unit that we've been, uh, you know, suggesting and selling to clients um, that can get your process water down to, to about five degrees Celsius. There are other options that are slightly more expensive that can get your, your water to come out of the wall at 0 0.5 degrees Celsius. Whatever it is, we really want to ensure that, that we're keeping the process as cold as possible from uh, a pre-rinse or a pre-soak all the way to the end. And so with our systems that operate on continuous flow, where we're constantly removing trichomes out of the process, what we've been getting clients to do is add uh, ice and water into their collection bucket before they put their bags on. And that way your hash is constantly ending up in a, in a really nice ice bath of fresh water. It's acting as a preliminary rinse. Of course, we'll still do a rinse when we go to collect with cold water. Um, but, uh, yeah, we really just want to ensure that that we're keeping things as cold as possible. It's going to keep trichome heads brittle, keep them easier to come off, as well as water does change property uh, as it goes through different temperatures. And with those properties will change how it's going to affect pulling uh, compounds out of the plant. Things like chlorophyll, waxes and fats, um, and other undesirables that we may not want to getting into our hash. Um, so to avoid that, like I said, just keeping things as cold as possible when we operate with continuous flow, uh, we're either using a glycol jacket on the tank or circulating our water back through an ice bath. And um, that's been really hugely helpful for us um, and has, has allowed us to start adding more biomass into our tanks, which is fantastic uh, without reducing the quality at all. I do find with, with the iceless methodology of processing, it is also a much more gentle uh, extraction on the plant. We don't have these big blocks of ice. 
uh, going through colliding, crushing bits of plant material, that is a great way to introduce contaminant into your product. So um, while I am keeping things cold, if I am hand washing or something, I just try to be mindful about my ice use, keep it to a minimum. I find I can get a much better flow pattern if I'm hand paddling, if I'm using less ice. When it comes to glycol jackets and things, I'll let uh, Dave talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. And um, look, I think glycol jacketing is really the way of the future uh, when you're talking about cold water extraction. Uh, as Andrew mentioned, we do have ways of doing iceless agitation, but still using ice to cool the process. And that's just as good. Uh, but ice machines in general are, are a place of, of a lot of contaminants. Uh, they break down regularly. Uh, and there's a lot of manual handling, shoveling and dumping ice, which uh, I'm sure nobody out there really enjoys. Um, so when using a black hole jacket, it isn't. It really is important to make sure you're avoiding ice formation on the inside of your agitation tank. Uh, we do see some systems out there, especially those with manual control over the black hole, um, that start to form, you know, like a one to two inch ring of, of ice around the inside of the tank. Um, this is down to just improper modulation of the glycol flow. So the glycol is either too too cold or it's flowing too fast or a combination of the two. Um, what's going to happen when ice formation occurs is, for one, you're reducing the actual volume of your agitation tank. So your, your, your mixing capacity gets reduced. Um, you're also uh, ruining the, the thermal transfer between the glycol and the process. Ice is a lot less thermally uh, efficient at transferring heat than, uh, than stainless steel. And so generally what you'll see is that the, the process temperature, while the ice looks cool, it looks like it's keeping everything cold, it's not going to be transferring temperature between the glycol and the process nearly as well. So the temperature in some in, in instances might actually drop. Um, lastly, there's always the chance of trapping trichomes in that ice layer. Uh, and that's obviously something we want to avoid to preserve yields. Um, the Whistler Technologies glycol systems all use modulating flow control valves and a PLC controlled thermostat function that controls the flow and temperature of glycol around that jacket. So you get really quick cooling at the start of the, the cool down cycle and then and then a really accurate maintenance of, of just above freezing point on your process temperature. All right, Andrew, you want to cover the uh, cold rooms, cool, cool ball controllers, yeah, et cetera? Absolutely. So cold rooms, another really great way to keep your process cold. Having a cold room is going to make your collection significantly easier. We've already talked about keeping your cool, uh, tools cold and things. Having a cold room just helps with that. It's going to eliminate ener any energy loss if you're working with a system without a glycol jacket that uh, that may be experiencing uh, getting warmed up from the room you're working in or so on. Um, I also personally find uh, if I'm hand paddling, I'm working very hard. I'm getting very sweaty. So if I'm working in a cold room, I find I can keep my energy up a lot more efficiently because um, I, I, I don't notice it uh, nearly as much. Coolbot controllers are a great way for, for smaller operations, whether you're working at home um, or even in a, in a regulated facility. A Coolbot controller allows you um, to basically turn a, a normal AC into something that, that can get a room much, much colder. You typically, what, what, what you'll want to do in this instance is oversize your AC for the room, um, you know, maybe 3, 4X. So if you have uh, a 500 square foot room, then work with an AC that's meant for you know 2,000 square feet. And the Coolbot controller essentially plugs into your AC and tricks it into a, allowing to continue cooling uh, beyond its minimum setting, which is usually 16 or 17 degrees Celsius. Um, really great way. Um, at home, I've even gone as far as just taking a four foot by eight foot grow tent, plugging in AC into that Coolbot controller, and I'll go and hand mix in there. Um, for more commercial operations, I've seen cool bots hooked up to mini splits, um, a really great and affordable way to get a cold room set up on a lower budget. If you have the option, I would definitely recommend uh, having some engineers come in, design a proper cold room, um, have the appropriate uh, HVAC system to maintain, you know, temperatures anywhere around four to eight degrees Celsius and being able to modulate that is fantastic. But if you are trying to to get started on a on a smaller budget the cool bot is a is a fantastic way to do that and then second outside temperatures outside temperatures can have a huge effect on not just the temperature of your room um, but also the temperature of your water coming in so uh you know making a ton of hash in canada has been great in the winters uh because it's really cold if i'm uh operating in a room you know 
maybe more at home than versus a regulated industry, but I can open up a window, get that room nice and cold, would typically probably um, avoid that in a, in a regulated setting because it, it may introduce contaminants at home. You know, it's, it's not as bad. Um, but then the temperature of the water will also get affected in the summers, the water coming the, your fresh water tap is going to come out a lot warmer than it does in the winter. So this is something to be mindful about. And if you're looking at sizing ice machines or so on, assume the warmest temperatures possible coming out of there. Don't take a reading in the middle of winter when it's negative 40 outside uh, and your water's coming out at four or five degrees and you're like, oh, this is fantastic. We don't need a chiller. Um, you know, we can get, you know, a, a smaller sized ice machine. No, you should really be assuming for worst case scenario because the summer months do come. It does get up to plus 30, plus 40 degrees Celsius. And then uh, obviously the water pipes underground and stuff are going to be warmed as a cause of that. Or in uh, regulated facilities, I see a lot of water uh, lines going through the ceiling and they may be coming out even warmer. The warmest I typically see water coming out is around 20 to 24 degrees Celsius. And that's something we definitely need to be cooling down before we're using that water to either rinse our hash, fill our tanks and be adding biomass to pre-rinsing um, any of that. We really want to ensure uh, the coldest temperatures possible. So anything to add to that, Dave? Oh, man, I think you covered it perfectly. Sweet. Well All right. So yes, um, this is another thing we I, I've already talked about rinsing and, and pre chilling the tools a little bit there. So I let, I'll let Dave get into the to the heat load equipment stuff. Uh, yeah, sure. So uh, obviously, we're trying to wash in, in a nice cold environment. And, uh, and and it's obvious then to try and avoid having uh, items in the room that are going to generate heat. Um, so any water chiller, uh, any uh, uh, glycol system, uh, any ice machine is going to have a condenser and that condenser is going to expel a, a boatload of heat out of it. Uh, and so where possible, uh, if you have to have those auxiliaries in the room, try and choose a remote condenser option where you can actually lo locate that heat generating source outside of the room. Um, if that's not possible, maybe trying to locate those auxiliaries out of the room. And if that's not possible, again, uh, then you really need to either have some sort of ducting to be uh, evacuating that heat source out of the room or you need to work really closely with your HVAC specialist when they're designing the, the refrigeration circuit to keep that temperature down. Make sure they're aware about the, the amount of heat um, that's going to be expelled into that room from those auxiliaries. Sweet. Um, I guess I didn't talk uh, talk too much about the importance of rinsing. You know, I talked about rinsing with cold water, but rinsing your hash before you collect onto your freeze dryer trays is really, really important. And there can be smaller size contaminants that are similar size to trichomes or smaller trichomes that have ended up in the wrong bag, especially when we're working with these larger quantities of hash and our bubble bags are, are absolutely inundated um, with, with clumps of, of wet hash and things. Going through and doing, doing a really proper rinse, figuring out what rinse times are, are good for you and, and then getting those into your SOPs is also really important. Um, if you're working in a, in a regulated operation where you may have different operators working uh, on different days or, or whatever it may be, keeping that rinsing process consistent and really ensuring to, to do your best to rinse out any foam. Uh, sometimes I can look in the bag and I'll, I'll see a slight layer of green that's floating on top. So just trying to rinse that through, um, having a really nice pressure on your sprayer. I really like a nice flat kind of V style spray that just kind of fans over everything at once. Having a bit of pressure, if there is contaminant, you might be able to break that contaminant and push it through the screen, uh, which is really nice. And that'll really ensure a uh, the, the highest quality product possible. Anecdotally, I've heard of hash makers um, in podcasts talking about this saying, oh, you know, before I started rinsing, I was always making something around a three, four star melt. When I learned about rinsing and started doing that, it went up into the five, six star range. And it's just something as simple as trying to get those contaminants out of the bag as best you can um, can really make a big difference in your final product. Yeah, and I think uh, as well, if you, if you really are shooting for that, you know, four, five, six star, if, if quality is your number one priority, then then avoid rinsing from one bag into the next. You know, if you're trying to push contaminants out of a top bag, don't be just pushing those contaminants into your next bag and then making the rinsing of that following bag even worse. And maybe those contaminants are going to get caught there. So if you're really looking for, for a money bag, 
I would recommend rinsing over a different bucket. You can still run all of that rinse water through your bags at the end of the day just to collect any trichomes that you may have rinsed through that bag. Um, but I think it's important to avoid having contaminants just going from one bag to the next, to the next, to the next, and eventually, you know, finding their way into, into one of those collections. Yeah, perfect. Sweet. Automation and repeatability. So, um, Dave, did you want to get things started there? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'll talk about the equipment, uh, continuous flow, and then I'll hand it off to you to talk about recipes if, uh, if that works for you. Buddy. Yeah. Awesome. Um, so choosing the right equipment and tools is obviously going to be really important, especially for those commercial operations, but even for the, for the at-home uh, processor, you know, making sure that you're sizing equipment correctly and, and choosing it based on, on your production goals. Um, so the, 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 I think the most inf important thing to consider before you even start looking around for equipment is deciding what your product goals are going to be. You know, what products are you trying to produce? What volume of those products do you need to produce to be sustainable as a business for those commercial guys? Uh, and what production costs uh, do you need to hit to remain competitive in today's market as well as tomorrow's? You know, price compression is already happening in the cannabis industry. So I think it's really important to look for ways to minimize production costs so that you can stay competitive uh, in the long run. Um, once you've answered that question, now you can really start to narrow it down. Um, you know, you can look at uh, what throughput capacity do I need uh, given a, a given a extraction efficiency to get to the volume that I'm trying to produce. Um, how much can I afford to spend on things like labor, water, power, filtration, consumables, et cetera. Um, you know, it's one thing just to look at throughput capacity, but if I, if I consume twice the amount of water to get to that throughput, um, now my RO filter needs changing, you know, the, the membranes need changing twice as often. I need twice as big a, a water chiller. I'm actually paying double the amount of water um, bill um, coming into that facility. Uh, my glycol system gets bigger. All the auxiliaries get bigger if I'm consuming more water to, to, to produce the same amount of product. So all of these things are going to impact the bottom line. And I think it's really important, especially in, in, in the competitive market that we're now all operating in, uh, to make sure these things are optimized from the beginning. Um, if those numbers aren't adding up and you're doing the maths and you're going, man, I just, I don't think I can compete. You know, my labor bill's too high. My water bill's going to be too high. Um, I'm buying biomass at a certain price. That's a fixed cost for me. I need to be able to sell this product at, at you know, X cost to be competitive, but my, my production costs are going to be too, too high um, for me to remain competitive in that environment. So if that is the case and that business case isn't really adding up for you, uh, then it's probably a good time to start to consider adding automation to your process. Um, you know, automation not only leads to less labor, but also better repeatability. Um, and I think that's really important as a brand is to have a consistent output of product and quality. Um, you know, your, your extraction efficiency needs to be repeatable, et cetera. Um, so, uh, Andrew, did you want to touch on uh, hand washing real quick or should I just keep uh, going straight into continuous flow? Yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit. So, um, of course, I, I really like hand washing and I'm working with smaller materials. Um, some people say that you cannot achieve the same quality of hash uh, with the machine as hand washing. I personally disagree. I find hand washing is great for these smaller quantities. But as we start ramping up into these higher quantities, it can be really tough to have a good agitation. You know, even when we're working in like a, a 65 gallon stainless steel um container and we've got maybe 12 kilos of fresh frozen in there it's really hard to to stay stay on top of that and also keep your energy up throughout the day it is a full body workout when you are making hash like that and it can be really tough to to ensure that you have a re repeatable and consistent process day in day out you know people do start to may start getting injured uh we've definitely um you know, in, in some operations seen of even HR concerns of, of people hurting their backs from just hand mixing all day long in, in these really larger style containers. And so that's where I think as we get into these more scaled operations, as you start trying to make products available to the masses, it makes a ton of sense to start looking at equipment instead of being like, okay, well, we're going to get 12 hand wash stations and 24 operators to do that. Um, that just doesn't really make sense how are you going to be able to keep all of those different operators consistent between each container and things and so on so i personally do definitely see a lot of value in, in investing in equipment to to keep your products at the quality they're at and still be able to to make those available to 
to more people, whether you're you're operating in a state or for the entire country or whatever it may be. So Dave, why don't you uh, get into continuous flow a little bit there? Yeah, we will do. And I think it's important to note, as we spoke about earlier, the your extraction efficiency is going to be dependent on how much energy you can impart on that mixture and also your run times. And so if it's up to you to physically be mixing throughout an entire day, uh, generally what we see is, is hand washing operations don't achieve nearly the same extraction efficiency as, as what you can achieve by, by just turning on a machine, going to lunch, you know, coming back and having a, a really efficient extraction. Um, so how can we start to add automation to our process? Well, of course, there's there's mechanical agitators as number one. Uh, removing that that need to have somebody paddling and all that labor cost is, is a really quick and easy way um, to start to add automation to that process. Um, next is, is to remove the manual labor required to, to pull those bags. You know, nobody enjoys pulling that 25 or 45 bag consistently day in, day out, especially when we're doing commercial quantities and there's a lot of hash falling onto those bags. It becomes a, a, a real labor to try and pull those through. Um, and, and so that's why we employ continuous flow. I already touched on that just quickly. So continuous flow where consistently or constantly sucking trichome laden water out of our agitation tank space through our 220 micron to 320 micron false bottom by discharging those trichomes and that water onto a, onto a vibratory sieve that's gonna dewater those trichomes. Filtered water gets sent back to the agitation tank in a closed loop cycle. And those trichomes are automatically discharged into our collection bucket um, for later uh, separation and collection. Um, so that's a great way to, uh, again, not only add more biomass into your, into your agitation tank, uh, but also remove that labor component uh, and make it really easy for the operator to just to just wash for a longer period of time and achieve a better extraction efficiency. Um, next on the list here, and this is one of my favorites, um, you know, it's, it's quite new to, to cold water extraction, as we like to call it now, and that's iceless operation. Um, you know, for any agitator that's been properly and designed with engineers that have experience in, in, in agitation, um, we have the ability to, to create as much or as little force or fluid forces across that biomass as we need. So we don't actually need to rely on ice to help us with that agitation to help to knock off trichomes because we have plenty of that power and that agitation ability built into our system. So by going iceless, we're removing a lot of volume, uh, solids volume from the tank that we can now replace with uh, with additional biomass and also it means that we can mix with a lot more rpm without creating those collisions creating that contaminants and, and basically putting a limitation on our maximum rpm so what we find is we can not only add more to the tank but we can mix harder and we can extract um, more quickly so our extraction efficiency is achieved in a shorter amount of time with a, a larger amount of biomass in the tank and that's how we're, we're able to consistently achieve some of the some of the throughput numbers that, that we have on our cut sheets and, and are available with our systems today um, and, and then i think uh, when we're talking automation i think adding repeatability to the process is also hugely important uh, it's one thing to get a great extraction efficiency on the first few weeks of an operation um, but it's another thing to consistently see um, good quality products and, and and a high extraction efficiency in the long run um, so I'll hand it over to, to Andrew now to talk about um, some, rep some recipes and, and how that ties into all of this. Yeah, so recipes, uh, probably one of my favorite features on our uh, newest WT Craft Plus system. Um, having the recipes, like I mentioned earlier, really allows you to, to have a dialed in process and repeatable process on how you're ramping up your agitation. And our recipes not only allow you to control how your agitator is going to ramp up throughout the process, but you can also set alarms for collections. And so for us, like I mentioned with the continuous flow, um, we can separate out our trichomes uh, by agitation time. And that's simply easily done just by swapping out our collection containers. We'll have a second collection container on standby with water and ice, throw that under the, uh, the discharge spout of the vibratory separator uh, where the hash is coming out of. And so if we're looking to say, okay, well, we've found that 20 minutes is the perfect amount of agitation time to get our A-grade rosin trichomes, then we'll get those separated out, swap out collection buckets, leave it for another 15, 20 minutes, allow a, a second grade to come out. And then finally, um, either you've done a collection, your first bucket is ready to go back into the system, or uh, you have a third bucket, whatever it may be, swap that in. And now you've got your food grade hash getting deposited into there. We have some clients who like to do a one hour and up to two hour run times to get uh, a fully thorough extraction. And 
Uh, these recipes are really just going to help keep things consistent. They're going to remind the operator, oh, I need to go and cut. I need to go and collect now. I need to swap out my buckets. And the agitator is is ramping up the speeds on its own, so they don't need to control that. Um, there's no risk of, oh, uh, I left the room for a couple minutes, and and now I've lost uh, some time on my process because it was uh, operating a little bit softer or a little bit harder than I wanted it to be. So um, if your system just has recipes that allow you to, to adjust your agitator settings, I still think that's fantastic any sort of automation that you can introduce into your process that, that'll keep things consistent, as well as having recipes that are going to be specific to different genetics. Um, this means that your operators don't have to remember how each uh, different material should be agitated. We do find there are some genetics that work really well with a higher RPM right out of the gate uh, or as soon as things are fluidized. And then there's other genetics that may um, perform and give a better output when you have a much slower ramp up to those to those higher agitation speeds and so having uh the opportunity to to just you know plug and play you know you've got one for for og kush you've got another one for your papaya and then you've got a third one for your bubba kush or whatever it may be um your operators can just hit the hit the recipe press go um and keep moving on and so that'll that'll keep your products consistent your consumers are going to appreciate that every time they go and buy a product from your brand it's going to be the same thing every time how often do you go out and and buy a can of coke and you drink it and it suddenly tastes different um that doesn't happen so for for these more regulated brands or or people operated uh operating in and you know jurisdictions with with less regulations and so on um your consumers are still going to want that product consistency because that's what they're familiar with overall when it comes to anything else that they're purchasing. So um, I'm a big fan of having those recipes. And if you are working in a more um, you know, manual operation or you're hand washing, having really specific SOPs uh, can be huge for this and, and keeping people accountable. Um, you know, keep an eye on the employees, making sure that they're following the SOPs and so on. But you can have working instructions that say if you're working with this genetic, then um, this is how we're going to wash it. If you're working with this genetic, then this is how we're going to wash it and so on. So, um, yeah. And finally, ending the day. Um, Dave, why don't you uh, why don't you start us off here? Yeah, absolutely. So um, as mentioned earlier, I think it's important to, to make sure you're consistent with your end of the day activities, uh, making sure you leave enough time uh, at the end of the day rather than trying to squeeze one more run in. You know, give, you, give yourself and your operators enough time to really uh, thoroughly be able to clean and dry that equipment at, at the end of each day. Um, so, you know, coming up with a, with a daily cleaning schedule, uh, a, a weekly and also a monthly, I think it's important to also deep clean equipment on a regular basis and make sure that it, that is being followed, um, just to make sure we're, we're keeping on top of, um, you know, the, the eventual buildup um, of resin and other things on your, on your equipment there. Um, so filling of cleaning forms, uh, making accountability, um, putting things up on the wall. I love visual references. Um, cleaning the lab as well. Um, so not only do you have to clean the equipment, you know, hash makers are also part-time janitors. Uh, Andrew loves to say um, it, it is part of the job. And, and unfortunately, that's just what's required to consistently make a uh, clean hash. Um, so really being particular about that, uh, making sure all the floors, all the walls, all the surfaces and benches, there's no there's no uh, dust or debris on, on any of the surfaces in the room. And again, that really ties back to if, if our room is waterproof, we have epoxy floors, all of our electrical is, is washed down rated. It makes that job pretty easy because we can actually just go around hosing things down rather than having to physically uh, spray and wipe. Um, when you're cleaning the equipment, uh, always follow the, rec the, the manufacturer's recommendations. Uh, select a cleaning solution that's going to be compatible with the surfaces and, and the gaskets and any other um, you know, uh, equipment that's going to be in contact with those cleaners. Make sure you verify that. Um, and, and also for those in commercial operations, make sure you're validating your cleaning procedure using swabs and, and other methods. Um, you know, visual inspection is great. So occasionally taking apart those piping networks and visually inspecting flexible hoses, the internals of valves and those kinds of things is really important. Um, but swabs are really the only way to properly verify that you've, you've successfully killed off uh, all microbiologicals uh, in that system. Uh, do you want to touch on cleaning of the bags there, Andrew? 
Yeah, absolutely. So, um, of course, cleaning our bags is uh, the these filter bags can can be a little bit tough to clean, uh, but we still want to be very careful how we're cleaning them, uh, what sort of solutions we're using to clean them, because it'll determine how long that bag is going to stick around for. If you're finding your hat, you're you're soaking your bags in ISO every day, that's going to reduce the longevity of them. What I typically try to do throughout the day is uh, as soon as I've finished collecting uh, off of a bag, I will bring it right to a cold water rinse area and give it a good spray down. Typically, you can get all of your solids off that bag if you're cleaning them really quickly after um, you've used them and you're using very cold water. As we start to, to use warm water, it's very possible that those, those trichomes are going to melt. Um, and get become very sticky on your bag. And then that's when we're gonna need to start looking um, at using ISO and things to, to clean those off. And if our bags are starting to, to you know decrease in lifetime, what can happen is that mesh is gonna start open up and they're no longer gonna be accurate to the advertised micron size on them. And what that's gonna mean is let's say in your 73 bag, if that starts turning into more of a 90 U bag, you're now losing a good chunk of trichomes that's now going to to a lesser grade product, which is really unfortunate. Um, and that's gonna mean lost revenue and other things. So taking the time to, to really ensure to, to clean your bags properly, just doing a nice cold rinse will really help extend the longevity of them, reduce how often you need to replace them, and also ensure you're you're getting the, the right hash where it's supposed to be and into those products that, that you really like. And finally, time requirements. Uh, this is something I'm definitely guilty of personally is let's say on an eight hour shift, um, I don't always uh, estimate how long it's gonna take to, to clean the lab appropriately. And that's gonna mean employees going into overtime or people rushing through that cleaning process. So I always tr tend to, to leave more room than less for cleaning. And what can happen is even if you do end up finishing a little bit early, you've got 30, 30 minutes to an hour at the end of your day of spare, that's time you can then spend organizing for the next day. And that can be, you know, organizing your lab, getting tools into the right places, getting your paperwork set up for the next day, whatever that looks like. Um, you know, maybe now you've got a little bit of extra time to, to go scrub that freeze dryer. Um, whatever it may be, really try to, to take your time while cleaning it and do it properly, do it effectively. Your equipment will thank you for it. Um, you know, it's all I always find it's personally nicer to be working in a clean environment where you're not worrying about it too much. So if you are um, finding you may not have enough time at the end of the day, try to to ensure to do a better job of cleaning throughout the day. You know, if you can make sure you can get the mop bucket out around lunch or something, give that a nice little wipe down. You know, if you're noticing hash is spraying onto different surfaces and things. Um, which it can end up on things that it shouldn't. Just give those a wipe down throughout the day and that'll save you time um, at the end of your day. Anything uh, to add there, Dave? Now let's get into the WT micro release Wait. button. So I think this is something that everybody's uh, been waiting for. Um, the engineering team and, and the, the entire t Whistler Tech team as a whole have been working uh, really hard to, to introduce uh, this to you guys. So without further ado, WT Micro, Dave. Why don't uh, why don't you uh, give us the pitch on this? Yeah, thanks, Andrew. Yeah, look, as Andrew mentioned, we've we've uh, we've been listening to to feedback from the industry, and we understand uh, that low cost solutions are, are sort of what's required in in the, the current market, the way that it is, especially for those smaller operators. Um, you know, we get a lot of people uh, who who really love the Whistler Technologies approach to making hash, uh, but maybe don't need the throughput of some of our bigger systems or don't have the budget. Uh, to really be able to justify that. So that's where the WT Micro comes in. Uh, so this is a 150 liter agitation vessel. Um, it's designed to be completely modular. It's it's the uh, trademark as the, the system that grows with you. Um, so you can start off with an agitator only. You can uh, put that agitator on a table. If you, if you believe in gravity draining, you can put it on the floor and add a pump. If you just wanna run a regular run and dump, uh, you can add our collection buckets. You can bring your own collection buckets to this system and we can help you with that. Uh, to get everything tied together really nicely. Um, for agitator only or anybody uh, planning to run ice in the agitation tank, um, you're gonna be able to wash up to 12 kilograms fresh frozen in, in this machine uh, per batch. 
Um, it, it, anybody who goes for the continuous flow model or chooses the glycol jacket, that bumps up to 20 kilograms fresh frozen. Um, so just to repeat that, we've got a 40 gallon agitation tank volume and we can wa wash up to 20 kilograms fresh frozen per batch successfully with a really good extraction efficiency. Um, so keep in mind that's that's a lot less water consumption, filtration costs, et cetera, are gonna go right down. And then when you're finally ready and you wanna have full automation in, in your process, um, adding the, the hash specific vibratory separator, we've, we've redesigned the vibratory separator specifically for our process. This is not something that's available off the shelf from any vibratory separator company across the world. This is specific to us. It, it, it does a really good job of dewatering the hash. It's got, an, it's got an automatic discharge of that hash to avoid having to rinse. Uh, there's no problems of losing hash under gaskets or any of those issues that you're likely to come across if you're using an off-the-shelf solution. We've used all of them in the past. We've been through almost every big brand. And this is our answer to a hash-specific vibratory separator that's really going to help optimize that process. Um, so this is the same size agitation capacity as what you see at the guys who are, who are doing really good things at Vedant Leaf. A lot of our media on our social media channels is, is, is of their lab. Um, these guys are washing with the vibratory separator, single operator, um, four, four batch runs in a day, um, 20 kilograms per batch. So 80 kilograms with a single operator running in a really small environment. And you see the quality of their product and the price point they're able to deliver those products to market. That's because they've optimized their, their production costs. You know, they don't have multiple people in the room pulling bags. They're not constantly having to train new staff that are quitting because of the all the manual labor required to do all of this. It's a, it's a really fun machine to run. It takes all of the hard work out of it, but still leaves that craft aspect so you can still run the machine however you want. Um, the most exciting part about this system is because we've optimized the design, we've really worked with our manufacturing, uh, we've reduced any unnecessary components and welds and those sorts of things. We still maintain Whistler Technologies quality on all of the components we've selected, but we've been really careful on how we select those and how we make that design. And that means that our agitator only price is now 38,000 US dollars. Uh, and then the full continuous flow model that you can add at any time throughout that process is gonna be somewhere around that 80, 82,000 US dollars. So we're really excited about bringing a, a, a full or fully automated system to market at that price point. Uh, and it still includes our double torus agitation um, in-tank uh, uh, false bottom uh, system that does in-tank filtration. As I mentioned, the, the vibratory separator that's hash specific and, and, and unique to us and the ability to run iceless agitation, even if you if you have an existing ice machine, you can put that ice in a different location in that continuous flow system and still achieve that 20 kilograms per batch, um, you know, a, as a process. Um, so look, I think we're, we're all pretty stoked about this uh, just in general. Um, and they'll, you'll, you'll be seeing a lot more uh, media released uh, in the coming in days and weeks and, and some extra brochures and stuff like that coming soon. So if anyone's interested, please feel free, send us a, send us a message. And um, we'd love to take you through the 3D models and really talk about how that process happens and why we're able to, to achieve such good numbers uh, with that single operator with, with really good extraction efficiencies. Yeah, great stuff, Dave. Yeah, I am definitely a big fan of this system. And uh, also a little shout out to the boys at Verdant Leaf. They're doing a great job. Uh, I was just in uh, Oregon a couple weeks ago. I stopped in at the dispensary and the bud tenders were just showing me all of their personal jars. They're like, we love smoking this stuff. Great quality, great price. Um, great crew of guys that come in every once in a while to talk about things and, you know, really passionate team over there doing really good stuff. And, um, you know, we're, we're super proud to, to be partnered with those guys and, and keeping them uh, operational and so on. So, um, yeah, shout, shout out to Verdant Leaf. And uh, let's, uh, let's move into the Q&A. So um, if anybody has questions, I think we did a pretty good job at, at answering some questions throughout the, uh, throughout the presentation in the chat there. Um, anybody else, if you want to, to throw a question down, if, you, if you'd like to get on the mic or something, raise your hand um, and we can unmute you there. Um, and feel free to ask any questions about uh, the process, the presentation, the WT Micro, uh, or whatever it may be. So uh, let's have it, guys. Sweet. Maybe, maybe we did too good of a job of, uh, of answering all those questions while they were, while they were getting posed in there. Yeah, uh, not seeing uh, not seeing too many come through right away, but um, 
that's definitely okay. May also be a, a little late for some people um, on the on the more eastern sides of the country. Um, Dank Duchess is stating that dry sift gets better. Terpenes extraction. What is your opinion on that? Fantastic question. So um, I'm definitely a big fan of dry sift products. I see a lot of guys doing really cool stuff, whether it's static separation or so on. Um, I think better terpenes is really hard to quantify. Uh, if you're working with dry sift, you obviously have to dry that material. Um, so you're going to be getting a different profile than you do with fresh frozen. When we dry our material and, you know, I'm talking about drying it effectively and not at 35 degrees Celsius, the way some people do for like a fast dry or whatever. Um, if you're going through like a really proper drying stage um, and a drying cure, whatever, you can have some terpenes that are changing and others that are just getting lost to that drying process. I haven't had the opportunity to look at some certificates of analysis side by side to say uh, which is higher in terpenes. I'd be willing to bet as a general rule that water hash is going to be higher in terpenes because it's easier to end up with a higher quality product, in my opinion, using this process. Once again, you can make fantastic products with dry sift. To me at this stage, it's a little bit less scalable. We are starting to look at um, scalable um, static sifting solutions that could be great for dry sifting operations. But at this stage, I would just say that that overall, um, before any post-processing, you're definitely ending up with a product that is probably richer in terpenes with the ice water extraction process. But once again, that is my opinion on the matter. We'll see if uh, Dave has anything to add to that. No, look, I think you covered that really well, Andrew. Um, you know, my thoughts are that, you know, whenever you dry, you're gonna lose terpenes, even in the most stringent drying environments. So capturing like snap freezing product and uh, doing the extraction right there, while, you know, ice water extraction, we may be exposed to losing a couple of water solubles. The majority of those terpenes are encapsulated within that, that trichome shell. So as long as we're, we're not uh, bursting those open during our process, which we shouldn't, um, it's hard to imagine that you're going to be able to capture more terpenes from a dried product um, than from, from something that's fresh, similar to, you know, using fresh basil versus dried basil. The smell, the flavor is always going to be more intense with that fresh herb coming in. So I uh, can't back that up with, uh, with scientific evidence in front of me right now, but uh, that would be my, my best guess. I see a couple te more technical questions. Dave, do you want to tackle those? Yeah, absolutely. So I'll start off with one from Jeremy Cook here. He says, uh, I see a lot of machines being square. Why is that? Uh, and that, that's a great question. So, so what happens uh, when, when we're designing an agitator? Uh, there, there's, uh, there's a few considerations that we need to make. Uh, obviously, our impeller design is going to impact the, the flow pattern inside of it. Um, but also what we need to make sure is that we avoid a, a phenomenon that's called swirling. So swirling basically means that if we've got all of our buds in the tank, let's just say we had a round tank with an impeller in the bottom and it's just spinning one direction. What's generally going to happen is, is everything's just going to start mixing in a circle and, and two buds that are next to each other are, are not likely to be separated from one another. So swirling just means that everything's moving around, but it's not actually being mixed or, or randomized inside of the tank. Um, so the way to avoid swirling is by adding some sort of baffling to that tank um, and, and a really cheap and, and sort of, uh, you know, a, a cheap and cheerful way of creating some kind of baffling is to have a square tank. So the square walls of that tank are, are going to help to avoid that, that circular sort of swirling motion and generally start to encourage a little bit of top to down mixing, which is then going to help to randomize those, um, you know, all the particles inside of that tank. Um, at Whistler Technologies, we use a round agitation tank with three baffles, which, which if you talk to any agitation specialist, they're going to tell you that that's, that's the most efficient um, agitator design that you can have. And then we combine that with our, with our custom impeller that, that creates that double torus flow. So we avoid swirling with those three baffles and then the two, the two impellers create a collision uh, of streams on the middle of the tank. Uh, so we can get more into that uh, maybe at a later time, but in general, that's what, that's what the square wall tanks are trying to do. They're trying to emulate that three baffle design, but in a way that, that means that they don't have to pay for baffles and additional components to go into that tank, uh, which can create some, some uh, manufacturing challenges, I'd say. Uh, next on the list here, uh, do glycol jackets ice up your agitation tank? Um, 
Uh, no. So, so our, our glycol jackets are all controlled by the PLC uh, thermostat function. So we have a modulating control valve that's going to modulate. It's not just an on-off. It's actually going to modulate the flow, the, the amount of flow of, of, of glycol going through that jacket. So it gives us a really nice fine control. Um, and that, that control valve is going to be controlled by the PLC. So the PLC is going to take temperature readings from inside of the agitation tank. It's going to take information that you've manually entered into the thermostat program to tell it your set point and, and how much variability you'd like to have on that set point. And it's going to modulate that flow in a really uh, adaptive way to make sure that we're always hovering right at that set point without ever going too low or too high. So basically, we're not just pumping tons and tons of glycol through and then breaking through our set point and creating ice. We're sitting just at that point um, and, and keeping everything moving it is all going to help to avoid uh, ice formation on the inside of that tank. Yes, totally. Um, I see a little question, uh, probably more towards me here. Um, got any favorite strains to wash? Yeah, absolutely. So um, one of my favorite flavors when it comes to hash is the tropical fruits, you know, papayas, uh, a little bit of mango in there, guava, other things like this. Um, what's also fantastic is those strains seem to wash really well. Um, they do not look very pretty if you're trying to grow for dry flower. They're going to be very loose, very larfy, typically. Anything that's like a papaya cake or a trapaya, a guava this or whatever it may be. Typically, those strains do look very ugly, not very visually appealing. Not going to be very nice if you open up a bag and find that. But when it comes to washing, they wash really well. Um, and those flavors come out really, really nice in the hash as well. So um for me personally one of the strains i grew on my back deck last summer was trapaya cake from six star selections definitely one of my favorite profiles got a ton of good reviews from all the local guys out west around here um and so that would be me dave uh any any preferred strains to to work with oh i mean i love the dumpers the the gmo the jomo those sorts of things um you know yeah. girl scout cookies is always a, a favorite uh and tropicana cookies i think uh for just general general aroma and, and and bag appeal uh some of my favorites there for sure yeah absolutely trop cookies is definitely one of my favorite strains i really like to find finos where the the orange profile isn't too dominating a lot mm -hmm. of times um strains with orange in it end up being almost the only flavor you can taste um, and orange terps are kind of more like, you know, 2018, 2016 kind of thing. Um, we're kind of past past those strong orange flavors. But I have, have found finos of, uh, of, of Tropicana cookies, which are, you know, a little more lavender, a little more berry dominant with a little bit of orange that comes out on the back end. So uh, those strains, whether it's a Tropicana cookies uh, or a turple that kind of smells like that. Turple is Tropicana cookies with slurricane fantastic really enjoy those so definitely agree there um i see a question about square being more difficult to clean i would say typically these square tanks do have rounded corners um so they might be a little bit easier to you know wipe around and stuff uh but compared to to a fully circular tank i would say a, a circular tank with baffles like ours is is going to be easier to clean but uh what do you think dave yeah, that's right. I mean, any sharp corners uh, in general, uh, like a 90 degree sharp corner with a small radius is always going to be difficult to clean. So I just watch out for, for that uh, when you're looking at the fabrication quality and, and design of things. Um, but yeah, I mean, a, a, a nice circular container. Um, our baffles are actually completely removable so you can take them out of the way and get really good access to the inside of that tank. And, and we also specify a really high quality surface finish. It's sort of one or two down from a mirrored finish. So it's a really shiny surface and we often find that just rinsing with cold water and then cycling through some bleach uh, solution is more than enough to keep those surfaces looking really shiny for many, many years to come. Yeah. Um, so Jeremy Cook here, uh, what about reusing water from a wash? Is it okay or should we always start with fresh? Um, I think this is going to be a matter of opinion and maybe Andrew's got a little bit more to say here. But in general, I would say that if your goal is to make the highest quality product possible, why risk jeopardizing that product um, for the sake of you know a few hundred liters of water i mean we do have we do have customers that like to reuse water from one wash to the next i think there is a limit and obviously you're going to start to leach excessive amounts of chlorophyll and other compounds into that water that over time might start to uh, affect the ph um, and you know if the ph goes wildly out of, of balance from from neutral 
maybe we're going to start to see those trichome shells start to start to erode and and things like that um, look it's not something that we've done extensive testing on um, but in general i would say if six stars your 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 goal then fresh water every time and in fact even adding some fresh water throughout the wash so maybe you do your first run dump dump the water um, you know maybe dilute that process water with some fresh water to start again um, just avoiding and I, and I think looking at the color of the water how much dirt is in there you know all those sorts of things are going to give you good feedback on whether or not you can reuse or, or if you need to start diluting or completely replacing that process water as you go yeah so i think my opinion on that like uh, if i'm hand washing and stuff i typically uh, avoid reusing my water in between washes and stuff i think with continuous flow where we're constantly pulling the track what pulling the trichomes out of that process water and putting them in the collection bucket it's a slightly different scenario i think ultimately what really matters is that we're getting those trichomes out of the process water and and avoiding the risk of, of some of that water saturating the trichomes um, adding a layer of, of undesirable compounds on top of that trichome and so on. So I think the longer it'll spend in process water, the worse it is. So, you know, like I said, if I'm doing a run and dump, you know, every wash, I'm, I'm throwing new water in there um, as long as I have enough ice to accommodate for that. I think in a commercial scenario where you maybe, if you're working, doing a, a run and dump process, but you're working with, with much larger volumes of water, you need to be a little bit more mindful of ice. Um, use and things like this what i might do is is at least replace the water between the first and second wash and ideally um have fresh water for both the first and second and then maybe reusing the water from there onwards you will also notice in um in a run and dump scenario uh between all of your washes the water does start to become more pale and i'm assuming this is because you've pulled out a lot of those those water soluble compounds and as you get into later washes, there's less of that in the process water. So that's why I think um, as a general rule, it might be safer to, to be reusing it a little bit later on. Um, in between batches and things, you know, when we're when we're swapping over and we're we're doing a changeover of material in the tank, um, I personally wouldn't be reusing water unless, you know, absolutely necessary. If, if you're in the middle of the desert and you only have 300 liters of water to work with for the entire day, then you're going to be reusing that water because that's what you have to do. Um, but in ideal situations where where it's going to be less of a concern, um, I would try to be replenishing my water um, whenever it makes sense. And uh, feeding the plants with processed water. Um, anecdotally, uh, I've definitely done it in uh, in like an organic soil kind of situation where our food is already in the soil. Um, I'm not really too sure how using processed water would work if you're also using a, a synthetic nutrient base where you're adding those nutrients into the water. I'm just not really sure how that's going to work with, with your total dissolved solids and your EC and all that fun stuff. Um, but in an organic soil situation and you're working with, with organic plants, there's no foreign pesticides or anything in that processed water. If everything is clean and organic, I don't see any reason why you wouldn't be able uh, to use that to irrigate the fields. Maybe just make sure that it's not still at zero degrees because your plants probably aren't going to love ice water getting poured on them. Some people do like to use ice water at harvest, but definitely not throughout your veg and, and main flower cycles. Dave, any thoughts on uh, feeding plants with processed water? Yeah, look, I think I agree with you there, Andrew. We do have some customers uh, who are doing uh, living soil organic farming, and, and they are definitely anecdotally telling us that, hey, our processed water, we're, we're feeding that to, our, to a certain, uh, you know, batch of plants, and those plants appear to be more healthy than, than the plants next to them as a control. Um, you know, we, we haven't done any scientific testing on that, but I think it definitely shows some merit. I mean, there's, there's plenty of nutrients that have, that have leached into that water, yeah. and if we can capture that rather than just pumping it down to the drain into a sewer system, Put it back into our regeneration of our farm uh, i think it's always going to be good yeah. and same to the biomass you know because we're not adding, adding any chemicals with cold water extraction that biomass can just be put straight into the compost pile uh, we can we can add it back to the back to the soil and and just continue that that natural cycle that we all uh you know uh, hopefully totally. strive for in this industry yeah i don't see process water being uh too far off from from feeding something like a compost tea that's also going to have tons of uh you know different plant stuff we'll say mm -hmm. going on in there i think it could be really interesting to use process water as a base for compost teas and things and then add other things to that mix it around do your aeration um processes and things and then 
you know, feeding that to the plants. But overall, like I said, as long as the 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 mass, the the organic um biomass you're working with is clean there's no pesticides to be worrying about and that um you're probably fine um definitely also recommend to people um try tasting your hash water i've washed some strains that that taste really good um and i cannot wait to see the first people to commercialize um process water into a drink i do think it'll happen um, I could see it being enjoyable, especially with maybe a little bit of THC infusion or something going on is, in there. That's, that's pretty good. Yeah. It's so, you know, depending on the strain, right? I'm probably not going to drink a GMO <laughs> processed water that tastes like feet and onions. Um, but with like a papaya or a guava um, kind of uh, kind of profile, you definitely come out and it's, it's just like a nice cold brew cannabis tea. Um, so, yeah, definitely give that a try. And yeah, look, just on the the spent biomass, obviously there is some some cannabinoid content uh, still uh, left there that we can't extract with, with cold water extraction. Uh, it would be possible to dry that biomass and run it through a you know a, a solvent based extraction method. Um, but I think in general, when you run the business case on that, um, you know you're going to get a much lower yield, obviously, because we're bringing biomass in that's only got a small amount of uh, of, of uh, cannabinoids left in it um so so far we we haven't seen anybody decide that that was going to be a, a profitable uh, way to go i mean i do like the idea of potentially uh, recycling that biomass and putting it into textiles and those sorts of uh, you know other things that can be made with hemp fibers um i'd love to see someone tackle that and and, and have a go at it because I, I think that you know the more that we can uh, find different uses for all of our waste streams um you know the more sustainable the industry is going to become yeah, absolutely. I think, uh, you know, it is 4.30 now. We've, we've done a pretty solid Q&A session, I think. So um, maybe we'll, uh, we'll, we'll bring this to a close at this point. Um, as always, all of our contact infos are here. Um, feel free to hit us up on Instagram, uh, email, give us a phone call in the office. Uh, we're always there to answer your phones, answer your questions anytime. Um, so please, uh, anybody who's interested in the micro, um, you know, give us a shout. We also do have our WT Craft Plus uh, and WT 2000 for the larger operations. Um, and yeah, thank you everybody for attending this. Yeah, thanks very much, everyone. I hope you have a good uh, rest of your day and, and weekend.